All right, hello, my name is Jeff DeBose. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the Notre Dame Radiation Lab. And today we'll be talking about the instrumentation for both nanosecond and femtosecond transient absorption spectroscopy. So this is part two of basically a two part video series. In the first part, we talk a lot more about the principles of transient absorption spectroscopy, a lot of the basics, you know, how to look at spectra and kinetics, literature examples. Um, so if you've missed that, that video, or if you're not as familiar with transient absorption, I would definitely recommend looking at that video first to give a pretty good basis of why we're doing these types of measurements, uh, because this video is going to be a lot more on the instrumentation and the schematics and how we actually generate transient absorption spectra. Uh, so with that, let's just sort of jump into things. Um, so to start with a little bit of sort of a historical look, um, you know, the early days of transient absorption spectroscopy, also sometimes called flash photolysis, you know, previously a fast chemical reaction was monitored on the hundreds of milliseconds time scale using typically stop flow apparatus, right? You have two different sort of liquid streams that then come together and mix, and you look at the changes and basically properties from there. Now, it was George Porter shown here who had the idea to use a flash of light to basically kick the system out of its equilibrium. And here's a quote from the Nobel lecture that he gave uh, saying it was the study of extremely fast chemical reactions affected by disturbing the equilibrium by means of very short pulses of energy, in this case, very short pulses of light. So Porter was in the Navy during World War II as a radar scientist, essentially looking at pulsed EM radiation or basically in the early days of sort of radar technology. And he went to Cambridge after that for a PhD advised under Norrish around 1945. And so one day he went actually to pick up a replacement continuous wave sort of xenon lamp bulb uh, from the Siemens factory. And there at the factory, he essentially saw the military flash lamps that they were producing. And these were originally used for sort of nighttime aerial photography. So if you want to take basically, you know, fast photographs uh, of, you know, planes as they're going by, uh, you know, the military is basically building out this very specific technology to do these sort of, you know, nighttime aerial photography things. And so when, when, uh, when Porter saw that, he had this idea to basically take the, these enormous flash lamps that the Navy was producing and actually use that to study kinetics of chemical reactions. Right. So this is actually a picture of sort of one of the original setups that they used. They were exciting with this flash lamp, the Navy aerial photography lamp, typically around like a two millisecond discharge. And they were probing the system with a less intense lamp with about a 50 microsecond flash duration. Um, they actually did sort of the timing of, you know, sort of the pump and the probe, if you will, actually using a physical timing wheel, which is kind of shown here. And this is around sort of 1949, 1950 or so. And so the early studies or the early systems that they studied uh, were actually quite useful later on for environmental chemistry. They looked at chlorine, oxygen, and nitrogen uh, gas mixtures. Uh, in this case, they showed different inter intermediates in the CLOO radical formation, uh, which is really essential actually later on for looking at why chlorofluorocarbons um, and essentially these different sort of, you know, RFCs and these different refrigerants, they actually form a lot of these un uh, very unhelpful things in the in the atmosphere that convert the ozone layer. So they were sort of, you know, doing this early work on what would actually become very useful chemistry. And they also looked a lot at the kinetics of OH radicals, which is something that even in the radiation lab today, we're still looking at sort of these interesting chemical reactions that happen with these OH radicals, which are important for photocatalysis and for nuclear waste uh, disposal and management and all sorts of interesting things. So you know, it was Eigen, Norrish, and Porter that got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1967 for sort of their work on, on essentially transient absorption. So that's sort of a little bit of the background and the basics, right? So how do we actually measure more modern transient absorption spectra, right? You know, over the years, we've gone from using sort of these flash lamps like xenon lamps, um, and a lot of sort of the, the, the evolution of transient absorption has been due to actually advances in the light excitation sources, right? The invention of the laser, you know, originating with like typically like ruby lasers, that was huge for transient absorption because the shorter that you can actually make your excitation pulse, uh, the faster the chemical reactions and kinetics you can actually measure. So over the years, as Thai Sapphire and, and the YAG lasers have gotten better and better, uh, even for a while there were, you know, dye-based lasers that were being used, uh, a lot of the evolution of transient absorption has also been sort of pinned to the evolution of laser technology. So if you think about how do we, you know, measure modern transient absorption spectroscopy, we're first going to talk about the instrumentation for nanosecond transient absorption, which has historically been called flash photolysis. So in nanosecond TA or transient absorption, we're typically using a nanosecond pulsed laser, typically something on the couple nanoseconds out to 15, 20, even 50 nanoseconds or so. And so that means that we can typically see things from the several nanosecond timescale out to the microsecond timescale and then even to the millisecond timescale. 
Sometimes you can reach all the way into seconds depending on your setup, but this is typically the window of the chemical reactions that we can see. Okay, so flash photolysis. Here's a schematic of the actual nanosecond TA setup in the Notre Dame Radiation Lab. You know, although this is specific to our setup, this is also pretty general to lots of setups that you'll still see today. So we're using a pulsed laser, in this case about a 15 nanosecond pulse width. It's an ND YAG laser, in this case a Spectrophysics Quanto Ray Pro, and that's going to basically be incident on the sample, and that's going to excite the sample into the excited state. And of course, in transient absorption, we're exciting and then we're probing the transient species that are formed. Again, if you're not familiar with what we're talking about, go ahead and go back to that first part of the video and that'll give you all the sort of the basics. But right, we excite the sample, we probe with a white light spectrum. In this case, our monitoring probe is from a xenon arc lamp. This is typically around, you know, a thousand watts, you know, fairly high energy, fairly intense. And in a lot of cases, we actually pulse this laser, or excuse me, this laser, we pulse this lamp even to higher amperage uh, to get even more light through the system. So again, this is a xenon lamp that's hitting the sample, right? Depending on what's being, you know, absorbing uh, or, you know, what's actually happening in the sample, you're going to get less of that, you know, light uh, typically through. And so you're going to look at the chains and transmittance of this white light probe, and that's going to go down and that's going to hit a monochromator. And so what we do is instead of looking at the whole spectrum, we typically only look at one wavelength at a time. So the monochromator allows us to basically pass a single wavelength to the photomultiplier tube, or also called the PMT. And then the changes in the voltage on the PMT are read by an oscilloscope, typically something with a fast response time of about one gigahertz. Um, so this is sort of the typical kind of schematic that we have. What's not ex uh, shown explicitly is the timing system that times all of these different things that are happening, the pulse generators or the computer that controls everything. So this is the schematic, but I think it's kind of a little bit more useful to show an actual picture of one of these setups. So again, this is a photo of our nanosecond PA system, our flash autolysis system in the radiation lab. So here we have basically our, our laser, our quanta ray from spectrophysics. It's, a, it's an ND YAG laser. It has a 1045 nanometer uh, fundamental, and that gets frequency doubled to 532, and then typically up to 355 nanometers for excitation, and that all happens in this region. But essentially, our laser pulse is going to come through here. It's going to hit a series of mirrors, and it's going to be incident on our sample, typically some sort of cuvette full of some interesting solution. So that's the pump line, the actual probe line, if you will, uh, that's going to be the xenon lamp. Uh, again, there's a pulser down here, which pulses it to even higher amperage. That white light is going to be hitting the sample, right? Something's going to be transiently absorbing. And then that white light basically is going to transmit through. It's going to go to our monochromator and our PMT, which is you know, located here. And then off in the distance, you know, sort of outside of where the, the photograph is, um, is actually the oscilloscope, the computer, the timing electronics, and a lot of this different stuff. So you might sort of be looking at this and thinking, wow, this looks kind of intimidating. Like it, you know, I personally couldn't go and just set up one of these myself uh, because you have to have a lot of sort of timing and electronics. And you know, these systems can be pretty complex to basically make a home built version of this. So if you're sort of thinking, oh, wow, this seems a little bit hard and difficult. Uh, luckily, these days there are companies that sell commercial systems. So Edinburgh Instruments actually sells a benchtop sort of turnkey laser flash photolysis spectrometer system. So this is the Edinburgh LP980 system. And again, this one, you can sort of commercially buy this and then couple it to a laser. And that way it kind of lowers the barrier, if you will, to actually doing these kind of transient absorption measurements. It used to be in the past that most things were more home built, but nowadays there's a lot of sort of commercial solutions uh, in order to you know, allow different laboratories um, to actually do these sort of interesting measurements. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about that detector, right? The detection in this case is through a photomultiplier tube, a PMT. So why do we actually need a PMT? Well, it's only a very small fraction of molecules that are typically excited in a transient absorption experiment, right? So these small absorbance changes, we have to be able to basically look at, you know, relatively few photons of light in order to see changes in like the milli-OD kind of region. So the PMT allows for sensitive detection because it is a signal enhancing device. So let's sort of look at that schematic down here. We have light that's coming from our monochromator, right? We had a whole white light probe of multiple wavelengths. We've gone down just to one wavelength. And when that light basically hits the photocathode, because of the photoelectric effect, one photon is going to basically produce an electron from the photocathode. Now, this is typically under high vacuum and accelerated through a series of basically electrodes. So that electron is going to shoot towards what's called this dynode, this plate right here. And every time the electron strikes the dynode, it's typically going to kick off multiple electrons. So you can maybe have one electron hitting and then five or seven electrons come out. And then all those electrons hit another dynode plate and another and another, on and on and on and on. And basically, every time you're striking, you're producing tons more electrons than you originally had. And by the time you hit the anode back here, you went from one photon and one electron 
to many, many electrons. And that allows you to basically create a large voltage response uh, that allows you to sort of see relatively low levels of light that are signal enhanced uh, to much greater uh, values. So in very high end systems, you can even get signal enhancement of about 10 to the eight, uh, depending on what kind of detection system you have. But this essentially allows for those relatively small changes in light to basically be detected. Um, Okay, so if I'm the PMT, I'm the photomultiplier tube, what is it actually seeing? Well, this is sort of a, a voltage versus time sort of graph showing, you know, the actual voltage response due to the light hitting the PMT, right? So initially we get a huge spike in the voltage once that white light starts basically hitting the PMT. That typically happens once we uh, pulse the xenon lamp. And you'll see everything becomes kind of wiggly in a very sort of... Uh, very sort of um, non-baseline, right? Initially we have a spike and everything becomes a little bit too crazy at first, but eventually after a, a one millisecond or so, we actually have sort of a nice stable baseline that starts to develop. And so what typically happens is the timing electronics are such that the laser pulse actually arrives in this sort of nice stable window after all the initial kind of weird you know, increase in voltage has already happened. So the laser pulse is actually gonna arrive within this relatively small window. And so that small window is actually blown up in this panel. So this is actually what we care about in transient absorption, right? We have the stable baseline. So we have a constant voltage as all that white light is again, continually hitting the PMT. And then once the laser pulse comes through, it's gonna excite our sample. And right in this case, it's showing a decrease in voltage. So that would mean that we must be transiently forming some species that's absorbing more light in the sample, meaning less light is actually hitting the detector. Thus the voltage is actually gonna suddenly drop. Right, voltage is proportional to light intensity, which is proportional to, you know, what kind of concentration of species are absorbing or emitting, or I should say absorbing or having a bleach of their absorbance. Right, so in this case, we have basically a decrease in voltage, a decrease or an increase in the amount of absorption. And then over time, as those transiently formed species basically decay back down to the ground state, you're gonna see the concomitant decrease in that voltage over time. And again, this time window is just you know several microseconds. So this is really the region of interest for nanosecond transient absorption. And this is where we tell everything to kind of look at. And really what it is, it's the oscilloscope that's gonna be changing or picking up these changes in the PMT voltage over time. Right, so that oscilloscope is what gives us really this fast sort of time resolution uh, so that we can actually record what's happening on the PMT. Uh, but this is sort of the basic idea of nanosecond flash photolysis or nanosecond transient absorption is we're getting the entire kinetic trace at a specific wavelength. Uh, but in order to build up a whole spectrum, we'd actually have to move the monochromator to a different wavelength, then record the whole kinetic trace, move the monochromator one more time to a different wavelength, get the whole kinetic trace and so on and so forth. So this is sort of the basic idea of what's happening in a flash photolysis experiment. Okay, so with any sort of system that you're using, any sort of technique that you're that you're working with, it's useful to talk about sort of what are the limits of this technique. And one of the main limitations of flash photolysis is we typically, at least for our system, get resolution down to you know 15 nanoseconds or so. And part of that is you know a twofold answer. Right, in this case, we have about a 15 nanosecond full at half max of our laser. So as the laser is moving through, it takes about 15 nanoseconds or so for that full laser to actually move through the sample. Right, so we can't resolve any processes that are happening at the 15 nanosecond and shorter time scale, because anytime the laser is still moving, you get a lot of laser scatter, and you just have a lot of sort of processes that are continually being generated, lots of things are continually happening, basically in every transient absorption experiment, and even actually in time resolved photoluminescence experiments, you're essentially limited to the actual pulse width of the laser. You can't typically see things that are on the order of the pulse width. You have to essentially wait for that laser pulse to come by, and then you can start seeing all those dynamic processes that happen. Right, and of course, as you can imagine, these days we know there's a lot of interesting processes that happen on the 15 nanosecond and shorter time scale. So we're definitely sort of limited by our resolution due to that laser. But there's actually a second thing um, that limits us, and that's actually the response time of our electronics. Right, the transient voltage change, which is again proportional to the absorption, right, this signal is detected by that electronic circuit, right? There's an oscilloscope that's reading those fast changes in the voltage. But anytime you have electrical signals running around any type of any type of electrical circuit, those signals essentially have you know a finite response time. So even if we had a femtosecond laser pulse, if we try to hook up you know the fastest oscilloscope we have, we can't look at you know changes in a PMT on the femtosecond time scale just because the electronic circuits take you know a finite amount of time to have those electronic signals basically pass back and forth. So in, in nanosecond flash photolysis, you're limited by your laser in a large part, but also just the basic response time of those electronic circuits.
Okay, so we've introduced and we've talked about flash photolysis. Now let's shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about femtosecond transient absorption. So this is a little bit more sort of the state of the art, if you will. Um, this is what a lot of labs sort of have these days to look at, you know, the shorter timescale processes. And in this case, we're typically using laser pulses that are generated that are around 35 or 100 or 200 femtoseconds in pulse width. Right, so that allows us to see from the many femtosecond timescale all the way out to picoseconds, out to nanoseconds. In some cases, we can kind of get a little bit to the microsecond time scale, but you'll have to use sort of different techniques for that. But essentially, this allows us to see in a much shorter time scale than the, than the flash photolysis experiments. Okay, so here's a schematic of the femtosecond transient absorption setup at the Notre Dame Radiation Lab. Um, I've sort of blocked out part of the actual total schematic because things get a little bit more complex and confusing here. But let's first sort of focus on this, which is the pump line. So we have our pulsed laser. It's an 800 nanometer, 35 femtosecond pulse width laser with about a one kilohertz repetition rate. So that laser pulse is gonna first be incident on a beam splitter, right? Some of the light's gonna go through the beam splitter for our probe line, but we're gonna ignore that for now. We're just gonna look at the fraction of light that goes up here and actually starts to interact with what we call our frequency doubling crystal. Or we can also interact it with the optical parametric amplifier, but let's just focus on the, the, the doubling crystal. So, you know, without going into sort of the nonlinear optics that actually underpin how this thing works, you know, for our intents and purposes, uh, we just have an 800 nanometer light. It gets doubled up to 400 nanometers, and it comes out here as still, again, a pulsed, roughly 35 femtosecond pulse width um, pump beam, and that's going to basically be incident on our sample, right? This, this sort of frequency doubling technique is what we used as well in the nanosecond transient absorption, because there we had 1045 nanometer fundamental laser that was doubled to 532 and then doubled one more time to 355 nanometers. And again, we're always trying to pump kind of further into the blue or into the UV, because a lot of interesting molecules that we look at have sort of that more kind of blue shifted absorption. But this is sort of the, the pump line. Again, it's relatively simple compared to now if we look at the probe line. So again, from the same pulsed laser, some of it went up here, the rest of it for the probe line is going to pass through, and it's going to hit these series of mirrors, which are on what's called an optical delay stage. So we'll talk a little bit more about why this thing is important, but essentially it's a motorized and computer controlled stage that can actually push these mirrors basically back and forth. Uh, but again, we'll talk a little bit about why that's important in a sec. For now, let's just say, okay, it hits these mirrors, goes down here, it's another series of mirrors, and now it's gonna interact with a different crystal. In this case, it's gonna be a sapphire and or calcium fluoride type crystal. Again, I won't talk about the sort of, you know, nonlinear optics that actually go into what happens to this crystal, but for our intents and purposes, we basically have an 800 nanometer pulse that's basically monochromatic. And once it moves through this crystal and interacts with it, it's actually gonna spread out and become a very, very broad white light probe. Uh, we call it kind of a super continuum that's actually generated. Right, so we've gone from monochromatic light, we basically smeared out the spectrum, and now we have light in the visible region from 400 to about 800 nanometers or so. And we still have roughly a 35 femtosecond pulse width. Uh, typically, you know, there is a bit of broadening in time with these laser pulses when they move through these different crystals. Um, but essentially we go and we generate our white light spectrum, and that's what actually probes the changes in absorption, right? We have our pump up here, and we have our probe beam down here. That's gonna go through the sample. Some things are gonna basically absorb that light. And then the change in the transmittance of this probe is going to be detected by this CCD or charge coupled device uh, detector or camera, if you will. Okay, so right off the bat, we can actually see that there's some notable differences between femtosecond transient absorption and nanosecond transient absorption. Uh, one of the main things is that the pump and the probe are generated from the same pulsed laser source. Right, we had this beam splitter, we split off a pump line and also a probe line, but both of them are about 35 femtoseconds in pulse width. Right, if we go back a few slides and show this, so right in nanosecond flash photolysis, we had the monitoring light, the probe light on for many, many milliseconds. It's almost sort of, you know, quasi continuous. And then we had the laser pulse come in and we watched the changes there. So that's the nanosecond, but in femtosecond transient absorption, right, we have basically two laser pulses that are both ultra short that allow us to do this technique. So that's one big difference. The other difference is the fact that in femtosecond transient absorption, we're typically using this CCD detector. And the CCD basically allows you to look at the full spectrum, so all the wavelengths, uh, but you know, in this case, we're only looking at one pump probe delay time. There's no oscilloscope, there's no you know, photomultiplier tube that's being used, it's a different detector. Okay, so let's ask ourselves, how do we actually change the pump and the probe delay time? 
right? So let's imagine if we were to actually take like a tape measure and physically measure the distance that the laser pulses have to actually move as it's going through this, this pump line. So let's say we do that and we measure it's exactly 200 centimeters of physical distance that the laser actually has to, that the laser pulse actually has to move through. And let's say we do the same thing. We take our tape measure, we measure this whole uh, pump line, and we say that, okay, to, to the sample, it's about 201 centimeters. So the difference between the pump and the probe line is exactly one centimeter. Well, the neat thing is we can just use basically the speed of light to see that, okay, with this distance between the pump and the probe, what does that actually give us in terms of the time delay? Right, so the speed of light roughly three times 10 to the eight meters per second, or three times 10 to the 10 centimeters per second, right, invert that, multiply by one centimeter, and that gives us that it's about 0 0.33 nanoseconds of time delay. If we make the probe pulse basically travel a little bit more distance, we can basically, using the speed of light, know when it's going to arrive relative to the pump. Okay, so that's all well and good. We can use sort of this you know, distance delay to actually change when these two pulses arrive. But let's say we wanted to get the uh, transient absorbance spectrum at exactly two picoseconds. Right, three times 10 to the eight meters per second, that's equal to 0.3 millimeters per picosecond. Multiply by two picoseconds, you'd have to basically delay the, the probe line by 0 0.66 millimeters. And obviously, as you can imagine, if you were to go take your tape measure and actually you know, move a mirror exactly 0 0.66 millimeters, that gets a little bit tedious and difficult, right? Because we also have to scan through multiple different pump probe delays. So this is where the optical delay stage actually comes in extremely handy, right? In this case, we have a set of mirrors that's actually on a computerized and controlled, basically, um, movable mount. Typically, in this case, there's a screw motor inside the actual uh, optical delay stage that allows you to very precisely move things. So this is what we actually use in order to change the pump probe delay. Right, let's say we want to go from 2 picoseconds to 50 picoseconds, right, we would actually physically move the optical delay stage. And again, we know that 0.33 millimeters per picosecond times now 50 picoseconds, that's exactly 15 millimeters. So the computer just tells the optical delay stage, move yourself exactly 15 millimeters, and that way we can get this trace. And let's say you wanted one at 500 picoseconds, right? We physically have that delay stage move back further in space so that we can have the, the probe actually hitting uh, further out in time. And again, 0.33 millimeters per picosecond times 500 picoseconds, that's exactly 150 millimeters. So this is sort of the trick that we use in femtosecond transient absorption. Uh, we're getting the full spectrum, but we're essentially sort of slowly building up the kinetics by actually having this mirror physically move back in space, and that changes what actually happens in time. Okay, so that's sort of the basic kind of schematic version of femtosecond transient absorption. Uh, this is an actual photograph of our you know, current femtosecond transient absorption system at the Notre Dame Radiation Lab. So here we have our spectrophysics solstice ACE laser. This is what generates the 800 nanometer, 35 femtosecond pulses. And now let's first look at what's happening with the probe line, right? So the, the, the laser light comes out here. It's going to be hitting, this is a little hard to see, but there's a beam splitter right here. So part of the light's going to be peeled off this way. It's going to hit this mirror, this mirror, uh, this is this is uh, technically a, a retroreflector that's basically stationary. Uh, this isn't actually the adjustable delay stage. So for our intents and purposes, we're just going to say that this is you know just a set of mirrors. So we're going to go here, here. We're going to hit this set of mirrors, and now we're going to couple things to this actual breadboard, which is kind of shown down here, which is where a lot of the interesting stuff happens uh, for our particular spectrometer. But actually, this is now. It's a little bit hard to see, but we'll show it more in the, in the next picture. But this is the actual optical uh, delay stage, the adjustable delay stage that allows us to basically push things back and forth. So this is going to be where the set of meters and the retroreflector are actually going to be basically moving backwards and forwards. And let's actually change the view a little bit. Now we're sort of you know backing up and looking at what's happening on this particular slice of the breadboard. So again, the laser light's coming in here. This is the adjustable delay stage. So this is the actual thing. You're gonna see it actually moving back further and further as we do our typical experiment and as we're trying to get more and more delay, right? And then after it goes through and gets delayed, it's gonna be hitting this mirror and then it's gonna be going through a relatively complex part of the uh, part of the system, right? It's gonna hit a neutral density wheel, which allows us to basically tune the power of the 800 nanometer laser, right? We're still at 800 nanometers for now until we actually hit this mirror and then we interact with this little crystal here. So this is the actual sapphire crystal that we use to generate that super continuum, right? As soon as it focuses and interacts with that, with that crystal, it's gonna broaden out in the wavelength range and it's gonna give us this large white light continuum and that's going to actually be what we probe the system with.
right? So it passes through that nonlinear crystal, and that's going to go here, and then our sample would typically be hanging somewhere around here. Okay, so that's the probe line. Let's go back to this view and then look at and think about what's happening with the pump line, right? The 800 nanometer light comes out of the laser. Part of it originally went this way for the probe line, but we're going to focus just on what's happening with the pump line, right? It's going to go through here. It's actually going to hit a mirror that's a little bit kind of like not shown in this in this photograph. It's going to bounce back and it's going to hit this guy. And this is where the actual BBO crystal um, is going to frequency double the 800 nanometer light up to 400 nanometers, and that's where we're going to basically pump most of our most of our system. So it's going to go through here. It's going to hit this mirror, this mirror, this mirror. It's going to pass through a color filter that passes the 400 nanometer light, but hopefully absorbs any residual 800 nanometer light. It's going to go through here and hit this mirror, and then now we're back on this sort of breadboard where a lot of the interesting things happen. And it's going to go through what's what we call the chopper in this case. So we need to discuss the chopper because it's a pretty important part of sort of how we, we develop a transient absorption spectrum, right? So transient absorbance, right? It's delta absorbance versus wavelength. The change in absorbance is the absorbance when we have both the pump and the probe hitting the, the sample, right? When we're pumping up to the excited state and probing in the excited state, minus the absorbance of just when we probe the system in the ground state. Right, so anytime we're trying to develop one of these delta absorbances, right, it's basically the combination of two different sets of, you know, miniature steps in the overall transient absorption um, sort of experiment. Right, so if we didn't have the chopper, we would just be having the pump and the probe hitting the sample each and every time. So we'd be having pump probe, pump probe, pump probe, right, every, you know, we have a one kilohertz rep rate from the laser, so a thousand times a second, we'd only be doing basically this part of the equation, which obviously wouldn't be good. We also need to occasionally, or not occasionally, we need to every other time get the absorbance of the system when we just have the probe hitting it. So the way that we actually do that is we hook up this chopper, this chopper, excuse me, so that it's communicating with the laser, and this chopper is going to be operating at what's called a 50% duty cycle. So we know that it's a one kilohertz repetition rate, for this, uh, for this laser. So this chopper is gonna be basically spinning at a rate of 500 Hertz. And so what the chopper actually does is it's basically a physical fan blade that's moving you know, in a certain you know, clockwise kind of fashion. And so what actually happens is during one pass, it's gonna actually block that pump pulse. So 50% of the time, the, the blade is gonna be in the position where it's actually gonna block our pump pulse. And so that means just the probe is actually gonna be hitting the sample. Right, so that allows us to basically, you know, take the just the absorbance of the system in the ground state, just the probe. So this is absorbance probe. And then on the next run, the uh, the fan blade is going to move just out of the way such that our pump pulse can go through. And that way we're pumping and probing at the same time. So again, there's a little bit of a time delay, but both the pump and the probe are hitting the sample. And that allows you to get the absorbance of the pump plus the probe. And that we need both basically both of those in order to get the delta absorbance. So this chopper is basically the way of basically allowing us to every other time have the actual pump hit the system. Right, so on one pass, we have pump and probe. That way we're taking the absorbance of the excited state. On the next pass, we block the pump. We just have the probe hitting it. That gives us the absorbance in the ground state. And this fan is basically just continually spinning. And this allows us to do this pump, pump probe, pump, pump probe kind of series again and again and again. And we average a lot of these different shots in order to get our spectrum. So this is why I've sort of you know, called out both the adjustable delay stage, but also the chopper, because these are two sort of important um, ideas or sort of concepts for how we actually generate a transient absorbance spectrum. OK, so I know that's a lot of information and a lot of pictures. One more set of pictures. We're just going to follow the pump line. Again, it's hit this set of mirrors right here. It's gone through our chopper. It's basically just going to hit another set of mirrors, another set of mirrors, and basically just avoid all of the, the complexity through here. And now this mirror is actually going to couple it so that the pump and the probe are actually going to be basically spatially overlapping and hitting our sample. So typically, we could put the sample kind of right around here. right? And that's, that's kind of the funny thing about transient absorption is you have to make sure that physically this pump and probe the you know, set of laser pulses are overlapping on the sample. So, you know, spatially you have to worry about it, but you also have to worry about temporally, you know, when is the pump and the probe, or when are they actually arriving relative to each other? You know, are they two picoseconds delayed, one nanosecond delayed, 50 picoseconds delayed? You know, we have to kind of think about all these different things. Um, and just as, as an aside, what we typically do is we typically have the spot size for the pump as pretty large compared to the relative spot size of the probe.
that way, you know, if, it, if they were roughly the same size, it'd be really difficult, you know, to actually sit there and physically overlap them. But if you make the pump area a little bit bigger than the probe area, it's a lot easier to basically overlap that so that you're not only probing, you know, something that's being half, you know, excited. You want to make sure that you're probing the whole area that's being excited by that pump laser. So as you can already sort of imagine, just looking at sort of the optics, the complexity of femtosecond transient absorption has scaled a lot more relative to nanosecond flash photolysis. And I think that's part of the reason why femtosecond transient absorption is a little bit more of a kind of a, a unique technique. Um, you need a much more expensive laser typically, and also you need more optics and a little bit more complexity for generating these spectra. Okay, so let's just kind of briefly review nanosecond versus femtosecond transient absorption before we move on. Again, in nanosecond transient absorption or flash photolysis, we're building up the entire um, kinetic trace, but only at one wavelength. So if you want to develop you know, a spectrum, you'd have to get the kinetic trace at one wavelength, move the monochromator a little bit, get the next kinetic trace, move the monochromator, get the next kinetic, tra next kinetic trace and so on and so forth, right? So that's flash photolysis, whereas in femtosecond transient absorption, because we're using the CCD detector, we're getting the entire spectrum. We're only doing it at one pump probe delay time until we actually physically move that optical delay kind of rail a little bit further in distance. And that allows us to basically slowly build up the kinetics, you know, by moving that, that optical delay and that by building an extra distance that the laser pulses have to travel. And again, if we ask ourselves, why is there this difference in recording the data? Well, obviously the lasers are different for flash photolysis versus femtosecond TA, but also the detection system is very different, right? Flash photolysis, we're using this variable monochromator, the PMT, and also the oscilloscope to basically measure those changes in voltage. Versus femtosecond TA, we have a CCD detector, and again, this variable pump probe delay through that optical delay rail. Okay, I've been mentioning sort of this CCD detector, this charge coupled device. Um, so this is essentially a multi-pixel device that allows us to basically, uh, you know, sort of detect multiple wavelengths simultaneously, right? If this is our white light probe pulse, which is coming through, it's going to be hitting this, this grating, and much like a, a prism, it's going to basically be spatially separating all the different wavelengths, you know, in actual distance. And so what we do is we have the grating here, and at a very specific distance, we place the CCD detector, because across the CCD detector, these different pixels are responsive to different sort of, you know, colors or different wavelengths of light, right? So over here, you can imagine, okay, we're dispersing sort of the higher energy UV and blue light here versus the lower energy green light and even lower energy red light. So that's sort of what a CCD detector allows us. That's why we can get the whole spectrum is because, you know, we're dispersing the light and we're looking at the entire spectrum at once. Um, in the specific Helios uh, ultrafast systems uh, spectrometer that we have and that we use, it's, you know, it's a very fancy grading. It's an aberration corrected holographic grading, uh, but that essentially just allows you to, dis to disperse the light, you know, very, very reproducibly. Um, now, typically, you know, you oftentimes need multiple detectors in order to see from the UV visible region all the way down to the near infrared region. So if you ever see a paper that shows, um, you know, spectral data from 300 nanometers out to, let's say, 1800 nanometers, normally that's actually two sets of data that are stitched together. Because uh, in the UV vis region, you're typically using something like a CMOS detector, whereas in the near IR region, you're using something like an in gas detector. Um, so in that case, you would do one set of experiments, flip some mirrors, couple into a different detector, and then redo the same experiment, and then hopefully the data stitches together nicely. But that's sort of on the, on the detection for the transient absorption. Okay, so just as with nanosecond, we should talk about the limits to femtosecond TA. So, you know, obviously, you know, from the nanosecond TA, we had 15 nanosecond pulse width. Now we're going all the way down to a 35 femtosecond pulse width. And that's 0 0.000035 nanoseconds. That's extremely, extremely short. Um, so in this case, we're not as limited by necessarily our laser pulse width in, a, in, a, in femtosecond TA. There are some processes that are faster than 35 femtoseconds, but most of the photochemistry, at least that we know of and that we care about these days, occurs on maybe the roughly 35 or 100 femtosecond and beyond sort of time scale. Obviously, if we look back in 20 or 50 years, we might laugh at that statement, because, um, of course, if, as attosecond laser pulses, which are three orders magnitude shorter, as those become 
more and more common, you know, there might be a whole set of interesting, you know, physics and chemistry that we can probe on with those lasers, you know, but for now, you know, sort of what we care about is typically on the many femtosecond to picosecond to nanosecond and beyond sort of time scale. So that's all to say sort of the limitation isn't so much in the shorter end of the time resolution, it's sort of in the upper bounds of time resolution for femtosecond TA. And the reason for that is the pump probe delay is set by this actual physical delay distance, right? Most systems that you buy commercially, they may only go up to about six to eight nanoseconds worth of actual pump probe delay, right? If we think about that, that's 0.3 uh, millimeters per picosecond, you know, times six to 8,000 picoseconds, that gives you about 180 to 240 extra centimeters of distance that you have to build into your optical delay line. All right, let's imagine if we wanted to go, in this case, out to 50 microseconds. You know, you need basically a 15,000 meter long distance to actually build in that extra, you know, many, many microsecond, you know, time delay. If you're doing that physically, you would need just an insanely long optical delay rail. And at a certain point, that just becomes untenable. You know, imagine if you wanted to go to 100 microseconds or even out to the millisecond time scale, using this sort of optical delay stage method just wouldn't really be physically possible because our laser tables are only so big and our rooms are only so long. Uh, so in this case, it's kind of an upper bounds of you know, a few nanoseconds that you can typically see uh, with most of these systems. Now, I say that there are these days some commercial spectrometers uh, that can be pumped by a femtosecond laser that can detect from about one nanosecond out to about 500 microseconds or so. Uh, so for example, ultrafast systems sells what's called the EO spectrometer kind of shown here. Um, this uses kind of a, a different way of, of doing the, the, the spectroscopy. Um, so I don't really have time to kind of dive into exactly how this works. Uh, but suffice it to say, if you want to go from the femtosecond time scale out to the microsecond, millisecond, or even second time scale, typically you either have two different setups where you have a flash photolysis setup and a separate treptosecond TA setup, or you have two different spectrometers um, one that uses an optical delay stage for femtosecond to a few nanoseconds, and then one that uses this particular spectrometer from a few nanoseconds out to microseconds. But most of the time, if you see someone showing sort of, you know, the transient absorption kinetics um, on many, many, many orders of magnitude time scale, that's typically sort of two different spectrometers or two different entire setups uh, where you have to basically stitch the data together to get an idea for what's happening. And again, that's just because of these limitations that we've talked about with these different systems. Okie dokie. Um, so with that, we're actually uh, arriving at the end of the, the talk. So again, nanosecond transient absorption, flash photolysis, and femtosecond transient absorption, we're, they're both providing us a lot of really interesting information on the excited state species, right? Triplets, singlets, energy transfer, proton coupled electron transfer, donor acceptor type interactions, um, you know, triplet and singlet manifolds, all sorts of interesting things. Again, if you're still not familiar with transient absorption, you know, please go back to that original sort of part one of this video for the principles of transient absorption, because uh, that'll give you a lot of the basics of why we care about this. Uh, but again, in both nanosecond and femtosecond TA, it's very different lasers, but also very different detection methods that are being used in order to look at those different time scales. Right, in flash photolysis, just to sort of hammer this point home a little bit, we're using these PMTs, these fast oscilloscopes, to look at the kinetics of the absorbance change one wavelength at a time, and then building up the spectra by scanning through multiple different wavelengths. Versus in femtosecond transient absorption, we're using a CCD detector in order to basically get the whole spectrum, uh, but we're only doing it at one pump probe delay, and we have to wait until the, the actual optical delay stage moves back a little bit, then reobtain the spectrum, move back a little bit, reobtain the spectrum. Right, so it's two sort of like inverted ways of basically building up slowly the whole TA set of data. Okay, so with that, I'll go ahead and conclude. So some references, uh, if you're interested, the Edinburgh Photonics LP920 Laser Flash Autolysis Manual. This is another really good, uh, useful resource that I used. Again, I'll sort of plug this principles of transient absorption video that's posted. Uh, that gives you a lot of sort of the basics and the fundamentals. If you're also looking for more basics, uh, Ken Hansen at FSU, he has this really great introductory video on transient absorption as well. Um, Michael Evans at Georgia Tech also has a really, really good uh, video as well that you should look at. And then if you're interested in the related technique of time-resolved photoluminescence uh, using specifically TCSPC, uh, time-correlated single photon counting, which is arguably the most common way of doing time-resolved PL, I do actually have a video posted as well. You can look at that. All the links to all the videos are in the description down below. Um, but yeah, with that, I'll sort of wrap things up. And thank you for listening to me drone on for about 40 minutes, <laughs> in this case about transient absorption. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them.